This video is brought to you by Captivating History. In the beginning, there was only nothingness and the Brahman. The Brahman, formless and beyond description, drew out of the nothingness and created beings, glorious immortals steeped in the power and lifeblood of eternity. From its conceptual self, the Brahman created all things, starting with Lord Brahma and Lord Vishnu. Thus were formed two of the three greatest gods. Though other immortals came after, these were the mightiest and most honored. Vishnu napped on the water, the first object created. The cool waves lulled him to sleep, rocking his greatness on their crests. His skin was blue. A shining egg appeared in the water, glowing as brightly as the sun. Brahma formed himself within the egg, growing and molding his form for a thousand years. Eventually, Brahma burst from the egg. The two pieces fell apart, creating heaven and earth respectively. Hidden inside those pieces were the land masses. Brahma shaped them with his mighty hands, forming the continents from the water. After he shaped the world, Brahma meditated. From his elevated thoughts sprang ten sons. These were the sages, the founts of wisdom to whom Brahma revealed his wisdom. Another god, Dharma, emerged from Brahma's mighty chest. Others tell another story. Lord Vishnu, the protector and preserver, formed for himself a Chatterbuj, a form with four arms. Prakriti, the feminine creative force, joined him in his effort. In his arms he held a lotus flower and his mace, the weapon of justice. From the ocean's waves came Lakshmi, whom Lord Vishnu accepted as his consort. From his navel grew a lotus flower, and its blossom stretched across the ocean. From the blossom emerged Brahma, the creator, and friend to Vishnu throughout eternity. Thus began the world of the gods, the dawn of the first beginning. A short time after the creation, Lord Brahma and Lord Vishnu chanced upon each other while walking in an empty plain. Greetings, Lord Brahma, said Lord Vishnu respectfully. Greetings, Lord Vishnu, Brahma responded. Where are you going over this barren plain? I go to look over my greatness, said Lord Vishnu proudly. In this world, my devotion takes first importance, and I go to listen to the prayers of my people. This reply did not please Lord Brahma. Many may pray to you, Lord Vishnu, he said, but they forgot who it was who gave them lips to pray. When they honor you in prayer, they honor me more, since I gave them the ground on which to worship. Lord Vishnu scowled, and the ground beneath him shook. If there be a greater power than I, then let him manifest. Between the two gods appeared a blazing pillar that stretched both into the sky and into the depths of the earth. Its light blinded them, and they raised their hands to ward off the glare. They craned their necks back until they touched the earth, yet they could not see the end of the pillar. Lord Brahma and Lord Vishnu were filled with wonder. Who could be mightier than both the Creator and the Preserver of the world? They decided to seek the end of the pillar. I shall change into a goose and seek the end of the pillar in eternity, said Lord Brahma. He stretched out his arms and they grew great white feathers, and his face narrowed to a goose's thin bill. I shall change into a boar and seek the end of the pillar in the earth, said Lord Vishnu. His blue skin changed to matted hair and his nose grew long, sharp tusks. Lord Brahma leaped into the sky, and Lord Vishnu dove into the earth, both seeking the end of the great pillar without a name. Lord Brahma beat his wings and soared past the treetops. He beat them again and rose above the hills. He beat them again and floated above the mountains. The pillar stretched higher still. He beat his wings even higher and soared among the heavens. He beat them again and rose among the stars. The pillar stretched higher still. Lord Brahma flew for ages, beyond time and eternity itself, until his wings ached and his feathers drooped with fatigue. Still, there was no end to the pillar. 
he returned to the empty plain. Lord Vishnu dug deep into the earth, past the roots of plants and trees. He dug further, snuffling his nose deeper, past the roots of rivers. The pillar stretched deeper. He dug deeper, past the feet of mountains. He dug deeper and deeper into the bottom of the earth itself. The pillar stretched farther still. Lord Vishnu dug until his tusks were dulled and his whiskers drooped with fatigue. Still, there was no end to the pillar. He returned to the empty plain. Lord Brahma called Lord Vishnu when he saw Lord Brahma land on the grasses. I have dug and dug and cannot find the end of the pillar. It does not end in the earth. Ah, Lord Vishnu, returned Lord Brahma. I have flown and flown and cannot find the end of the pillar. It does not end in the sky. The pillar shook and the earth trembled. It shook again and the sky shuddered. It shook a third time and a shining figure stepped from its depths. His skin was marred with basma and his head was matted and curly. A third eye called Triambicum burned in his forehead. A snake hissed at his throat. He lowered his trident, the Trasul. Lord Brahma and Lord Vishnu bowed in acknowledgement. Here, true, was a power as great, if not greater, than their own. Thus was born Lord Shiva, the destroyer, lord of demons. He made his home in Varanasi and married Parvani, from whom he was rarely separated. But that is a story for another page. After the creation, Brahma looked over the world and was pleased. He saw the water and the land, the mountains and hills. He saw the sun, Aditya, whose rays blessed the earth. He saw the sages sprung from his thought. But none of these beings, as yet, had been born to a mother and father. So, Lord Brahma drew from his own body a form, half male and half female. The male was called Swayambhu Manu, and the female, Shatarupa. We know her better by another name, Saraswati. Saraswati's dark hair stretched to her waist, and her face was pure and open. In her hands, she held a vena by which to bless the universe with music and wisdom. Hansa, the swan, bore her on his back. When he saw the beauty of Saraswati, Lord Brahma's soul moved within him. He longed for her as his wife, but Saraswati, drawn from his own body, was like his daughter. One day, she approached Lord Brahma to pay her respects. He gazed at her with intense desire. When she circled behind him, he could see her no longer. So great was his longing that a second head sprouted from behind his first one, the better to gaze on Saraswati and her beauty. Saraswati passed to Lord Brahma's left, and a third head appeared to gaze at her still. When she passed to his right, yet another, a fourth head, sprouted from his shoulders so she could not escape his sight. The attention troubled Saraswati. To gain a moment's peace from Brahma's desire, she jumped over his head. A fifth head sprouted from Brahma's shoulders so that Saraswati could find no rest from his interest. Lord Shiva witnessed the performance and was displeased. It is not lawful to pursue your daughter, Lord Brahma, he said. Four of Brahma's heads praised Shiva in agreement. The fifth head hissed and reviled Shiva for his interference. Lord Shiva drew his sword. A head that speaks in such a way shall not speak at all. And so Lord Brahma lost his fifth head that spoke evilly to Lord Shiva. Eventually, Brahma and Saraswati married and have lived together since. Shatarupa married Swayambhu Manu and produced the first children. Thus began the cycle of fathers and mothers from the first man and woman. Shiva tests Parvati. In the Himalayas there lived a great king. He and his wife, Meena Devi, served Lord Shiva and offered him many respects. But they were unfulfilled. They wished for one thing and one thing only for a daughter to grow and become the wife of Shiva. Oh, that our family could be worthy of this honor, cried Himayantha, the king. I'm a ruler, yet I am poor as the poorest peasant without this gift. Then let us perform a tapasya, answered Minadevi. 
It will please Goradevi, the wife of Shiva. Perhaps she will be reborn as our daughter. King Himayantha agreed. Mina Devi began her tapasya. The sun rose and fell, and still she meditated. The shadows chased themselves across her face, and still she meditated. No food crossed her lips, and no water wet her tongue. Finally, after three days, Gauri Devi heard the meditation of Mina Devi. I am pleased by your devotion, said Gauri Devi. What do you ask of me? Great Goddess, said Mina Devi, bowing herself to the ground. Himayantha is a great ruler among men, and I am his wife. But our wealth is nothing without a blessing. We wish only to have you as our daughter and raise you to be the wife of Shiva. The request pleased Gauradevi. I will be reborn as your daughter. Lord Shiva will grieve, but you will find me again. Gauradevi leaped into a fire. Her form as Gauradevi perished in the flames, and Shiva lamented her loss. Meanwhile, Mina Devi conceived and bore a daughter. She named her Parvati. Her first word was Shiva, and by this her parents knew that Gauradevi had kept her promise. Parvati grew fairer and wiser every day, until she was finally of the age to seek Shiva. After Gauradevi perished in the flames, Lord Shiva meditated for many years to mourn her loss. He meditated so deeply that he neither heard sound nor saw sights without the depth of his mourning. When the time came for Parvati to wed Shiva, he could neither see nor hear her. The king consulted with Narada, a wise sage. What is to be done? King Himayantha asked. Our daughter must wed Lord Shiva, but his mind wanders in other paths. Lord Shiva is deep in meditation, answered Narada. But the prayers of worship may still reach his ears. Send Parvati to pray at his shrine, and perhaps he will hear her voice if her devotion is pure. Himayantha was pleased with this counsel, and sent Parvati to the shrine of Lord Shiva. When Parvati's eyes fell on Lord Shiva deep in his meditation, her heart danced within her, and she determined to offer reverence to none but him. She performed tapasya in his honor, and offered him worship by every means within her power. Her devotions did not cease with the night, but continued through till the dawn. She prayed until her voice croaked and her eyes drooped with fatigue. Deep in his meditation, Lord Shiva heard her prayers. This truly is a pure woman, he thought, who prays and offers worship to me without ceasing. Perhaps I shall take her as my wife. But first, Lord Shiva sought to test Parvati, for perhaps she loved something better than he. He dressed in robes of gold silk and wore the face of a rich Brahmin. Coming to the shrine where Parvati continued to pray, he feigned oblation to Shiva before turning to her. Would you waste your devotions at a shrine of no consequence? Parvati's eyes flashed, but she did not stop her worship. Lord Shiva hid his smile and tried again. Would you wish to live without wealth, with only the ashes as your comfort? Parvati turned her back to him and continued to pray, but her hands shook with anger. Lord Shiva was pleased, but tested her a third time. It would be a pity for a beautiful rich girl to marry a poor beggar, though he be a god. Parvati spun around. I will marry none but Shiva. I am he. Lord Shiva cast away his disguise, revealing his true nature. Parvati clapped her hands for joy and fell at his feet. Lord Shiva raised her gently. You have proven your devotion. I will take you as my bride. Himayantha and Mina Devi were overjoyed by Parvati's marriage and blessed the goddess for keeping her promise to them. And so Lord Shiva and his consort Parvati were married. If you want to learn more about Hindu mythology, then check out our book, Hindu Mythology, a captivating guide to Hindu myths, Hindu gods, and Hindu goddesses. Also, if you haven't already gotten your free mythology ebook bundle, grab it while it's still free. All links are in the description. Please hit the like button if you enjoyed the video 
and subscribe if you want us to create more videos like this.